little bit below par. Yeah, but it's still sufficient. If there's a spacecraft up there, you pick it up. The fact the thing's got an electric, it's got this magnetic type force field around it, that detector will pick it up anyway. Well, if there's any flying saucers about or extraterrestrial craft, we may be fortunate enough to detect yeah. something. Yeah. If they're there, though, they're hidden well and truly in the clouds. Scan along, look, scan right. along the edge of the cloud. What, the one near the sun there? Yeah, scan along the edge of the clouds. Go around the, around the perimeter That's of that it. cloud. That's it, because very often they hide. You know, they use the clouds of cover, and you see the crafty so-and-so, they, they just hide there. Yeah. I work for the LEV. Paul works as an embalmer, and it doesn't mean that we have an awful lot of free time. What we're trying to do is to obtain either actual contact or possibly pick up some type of intelligent message relayed from the people who man these craft. When I think of some of the sightings that we have had, where we have gone out, signalled with a a flashlight and then had a, a response to our signal then that most certainly proves that someone or something must have been monitoring us and watching every movement it was in august 19, 1961 about 11 o'clock one night and uh, i was waiting for a train at parsons green station uh, it was a, you know, it was a hazy type of a night, but you could see a few odd stars and one yeah, of Yeah, a typical things. London night. And in order to pass the time, I was just letting my eyes just roam around the sky, you know. And as I yeah. looked, it was as if there, right on the horizon where the housetops were, was a red light. Like a plane light? Yeah, it was, it was plane. exactly the same colour as a plane. Uh, I took no notice. I carried on, so just my eyes ran around the sky and uh, this red light started to come towards us and as it started to come towards us yeah uh, I still didn't think any more of it you know there was no noise attached to the thing no it was completely silent and then it came on and came on and then I suddenly, it was as if everything seemed to happen at once. I suddenly became aware that this red light was attached to something very, very large, but I couldn't see what it was and there was still no noise. Still you began to suspect it, it's not a plane. I had my suspicions, put it that way, but I couldn't yeah. prove anything. And then, bang! It was as if the whole thing became visible. The red light, if you could imagine that this was a saucer, yeah. the red light was underneath the thing, and you could sort of see the underneath of this craft because of the glow that was coming off of it. So the whole bulk of it was above the red light. And you could see the thing, it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't sort of fly along steadily like that, but it sort of seemed as if it seemed to waver, you know? Sort of oscillating. That's right. You call and it that, yeah. The thing sort of seemed to, one minute it was as if I was looking at it from that angle, and then it seemed to tilt so I could sort of see a bit underneath it, and the top as well. I'll be damned, it was a blinking flying saucer. It was the... identical with the thing that George Adamski saw. And so that I could see it clearly, all around this craft was like a golden glow around the whole periphery of the craft. It was throwing out an energy field and around itself. Yeah. Len saw that with me. Yeah, that's really incredible. And so that. did Mike. Yeah, and really incredible. That was flying through the skies of London at quarter past eleven one Saturday night. And you didn't read about it in the papers the next day. Who'd have believed me if I'd have phoned, if I'd have phoned up the air ministry? Do you think they would have believed yeah. me? Strange objects have been reported since the beginning of recorded history. Some a foot or so wide, others thirty feet or more. This woodcut from Nuremberg dates back to 1561. And this one, also from Germany, appeared in 1566. Usually the objects are reported to be circular or cigar-shaped. 
The earliest known photograph was taken in Mexico in 1883. Several hundred objects were seen crossing the sun, and simultaneous sightings were reported from Mexico City and Puebla. Hundreds of thousands of photographs have been taken. Most have been dismissed as fakes. But this one, taken over Oregon in 1950, has never been satisfactorily explained. In January 1958, a Brazilian naval vessel was engaged in marine research off an island in the Atlantic when a strange object was sighted over the sea. It was seen simultaneously by a number of observers gathered on the deck. One of them, an expert photographer, took these pictures. The object moved at low speed over the mountains and disappeared briefly behind a peak. It was then seen again, flying away at high speed before it disappeared. This film was taken by an amateur photographer in Montana in 1950. It's been analysed over and over again. Some people see two round silvery craft. Others believe it's two Air Force jets reflecting the sunlight as they circle to land at a nearby airport. Alleged UFO sightings are always the subject of intense investigation and speculation. An ATV camera unit were filming in a field in Oxfordshire in 1971 when they saw a bright orange ball in the sky. People in six other locations in the district later reported sightings as well. After some seconds, the object moved off, leaving a vapour trail. Many theories, including jets unloading fuel, have been offered as explanations, and the cameraman included a foreground shot to show that there was no trickery. Detailed examination and inquiries about the film seem to eliminate conventional jets or planes, and these pictures imply enormous changes of speed. Then, at nine o'clock on a morning in 1973, a building surveyor, Peter Day, filmed this red ball in Buckinghamshire from his stationary car. Other people in the area also saw something at the same time. Coincidentally, 45 minutes later, a plane crash was reported in the area. This last frame of film is the subject of speculation. The object can no longer be seen, and if the camera wasn't jogged, the trees appear to be bent by some huge force. In January 1976, film was taken of the British Concorde travelling at subsonic speed. At one stage, the film shows what appears to be an object descending below Concorde, then ascending to travel parallel with it, and finally moving away over the top at great speed. This is what was seen. And here it is again in slow motion. British Airways believe it was caused by a foreign particle in the optical mechanism of the camera filming Concord. This sequence was filmed in America a few years ago. Thousands of people saw an object in the sky in the Rocky Mountain states. Hundreds of people reported it. Dozens photographed it. This film was shot by a tourist and it shows, in fact, a huge fireball, a boulder about the size of a three-story house skimming the Earth's atmosphere in Wyoming and travelling on into space. But it's no longer the objects in the skies that are stirring the imagination. Like the angels of history, reports have come of flying men, humanoids, arriving in chariots from the skies. Man's innate religious instincts may be the reason for the interest in creatures from space or it may be a reaction against orthodox science. The Aetherius Society was founded by an ex-taxi driver, George King, after a voice told him he was to be the earthly representative of interplanetary parliament. Twenty years ago, he was told to come to this hill in Devon, which is now a place of special pilgrimage and prayer. It was around midnight on July 23, 1958, 
that he had his strange encounter. And it was very, very windy on the top of Holston Down. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was quite dark by this time. And uh, dimly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something in the sky. Uh, and I thought, well, if I'm going to have uh, another contact, it'll happen anyway. Nothing that I do will either stop it or precipitate it. So I went on with my praying and, uh, and in a yoga fashion. And uh, then I saw a being uh, which uh, uh, kind of appeared before me, if you like. I mean, I didn't see him walk up to me. I mean, I opened my eyes and he was there. Uh, he was very tall. He was dressed in a long robe. Uh, which covered uh, the usual type of one-piece suit that several people have spoken about in the past when they have met people from other worlds. Uh, he had long brownish hair, light brownish hair. Uh, now, it's strange that I could see the, the, the color of this, but I could because there was so much radiance around the the, the man, um, and uh, I knew, although he didn't tell me, but I knew that he was um, Jesus, and I knew that he'd come from the planet Venus. I didn't have to be told, I just knew this. I think it was some telepathic impression that I picked up. It was very strong, there was no denying it, and there was no denying his presence. And <clears throat> he sent power from himself through me, and uh, <clears throat> into the mountain top here, and uh, I was told later by interplanetary sources uh, that this mountain was holy, and uh, that's why we use Holston Down uh, because we really and truly do believe that it is holy. Now, in this case, did this figure of Christ just materialize, or did he come in some sort of space <clears throat> craft, or? Well, as far as I'm concerned, he, he did come in a spacecraft, but I didn't see him get out of the craft, and I didn't see him walk towards me. <clears throat> I became aware he was there. Now, but when you he... saw a craft? Yes, I did a little later, yes. Which looked like what? Uh, which looked like uh, the usual type of flying saucer, of which I have a, a model here. It, uh, this is a what we call a scout patrol craft. Um, I, I must tell you this before I go on about th th these, if I may. When he left, I definitely saw him move to the side and, and the craft similar to this hovering above the ground and there was a green beam of light came from the bottom here down to the ground and he just moved to one side into the green beam and was gone. Now we're here today to use our mantra and prayer to charge up a prayer power battery. At the moment this battery has uh, almost 600 hours of prayer energy in it and by the end of the session today we should have filled it. As you know we were informed from cosmic sources that there will be a period of uh, emergency from October the 23rd until December the 11th, and that's why we're meeting here today to finish charging this battery so that we have the power available at any time we need it. Now, let me get this clear. This battery is being charged with prayer. Uh, this battery is being charged with energy invoked by prayer. And stored. And stored in a physical container until such a time as it is needed. 
Uh, you know, if there is an earthquake, let's hope there won't be, but if there is, it's very difficult to bring 200 people together uh, at a moment's notice. But if you have the results of 700 prayer hours in a physical container, you can release it at a moment's notice, any hour of the you, day or you night. Beam it. It. You beam it in a certain direction. Yes, we put it on a quite a large piece piece of mechanism which I have invented and it's sent out through an antenna a very specially made antenna and it can be guided to any part of the world blessed are the wise ones for they walk through a dark and ignorant world spreading their light Blessed are the wise ones, for they walk through a dark and ignorant world, spreading their light. Blessed are they who love, for they are the disciples of God. Almighty God, who is the creator of all things, we pray that your light may shine through us all so that we may transmit this unto the world. Now, Mr. King, you've got your followers in this and you've got your theories in this. How many times have you been told by people that this is a load of, you know, complete and utter rubbish? Uh, when it comes to Operation Prayer Power, not too many times, oddly enough, because, you know, all religions are founded on prayer. And if they don't have prayer, what else have they got? I haven't invented prayer. All I've done is to uh, invent a mechanism whereby prayer, which has been known throughout the centuries to work, uh, can be used in a very potent, dynamic fashion. Om Rao, Om Rao Re, 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 Om Rao. Glastonbury, Stonehenge. Now, this is classic flying saucer country. Yes, absolutely. And we often imagine that if we were flying in a direct line over here, in fact, we would be on a straight course exactly between Stonehenge, which is to our east here, at the top of the barn, if we were looking down at the top of the barn, and straight in line with that would be Glastonbury towards the west. And you, Arthur Shuttlewood, are famous, or to some people notorious, as one of the great... Notorious, I think, <laughs> yes. In any way. I think, really. Yes, uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm listed among the, quote, nuts, unquote, or sometimes not quote at all, brigade, certainly, because of my way out views. But they've only been inculcated in me because of what we've seen and what we've experienced, and fortunately have been experienced by many others in the world. Uh, don't forget that I started out as a hard-headed, ultra-realistic type of journalist. We've got to be sticklers for absolute fact. Uh, the strangest thing, in fact, that ever happened to me personally on these hills here was uh, when I went up a little defile uh, near Cradle Hill, at the top of Cradle Hill, uh, where there's an army rubbish refuse dump. And uh, I went along this little track because I could see clearly, or fairly clearly anyway, the glowing to my right, the glowing to my left, that appeared to be circular, that appeared to be cylindrical, and in front of me, a rather large light that lit up the trees in front of me. And uh, I was drawn, because it appeared to be the nearest of the three, I was drawn towards the light in front, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that's UFO. I couldn't explain what that was. It wasn't anything conventional, and I hastened towards it. But then I was aware of being lifted off the ground, literally, and uh, I was aware of some energy coming from the lights at either side, which had closed in rather frighteningly. 
But I wasn't frightened, I just teetered in mid-air, if you like, several feet up, obviously, and I just couldn't feel any pressure under my legs at all. And I'd stop running, and my, my legs were s simply gangling about like this without any, any foundation to, to uh, tread upon. And this went on, perhaps I was hovering in this sort of fashion, and yet still being propelled slowly forward for a good half minute or more. And that is gospel truth. Did you fall well, down? It was the most amazing experience I ever had. No, I didn't fall. I was simply lowered very gently back to the earth. The Flying Saucer Review is the main journal in Britain which collects all the data about all the strange things. For instance, figures like this, humanoid figures. This one, I think, reported from Finland. Um, extraordinary details of sources coming down, people being affected by rays. Um, the magazine is full of teleportation, stories of cars being moved from one place to another. Now, Charles Bowen is the editor of this. You spent years collecting all this data. What, what's it all about? I'd like to know what it's all about. I've been involved with this myself for something like 12 years, closely, as editor of the review. We get reports from all over the world, particularly from South America, everywhere, practically. Is there any pattern? Now? There are small patterns from time to time, uh, small patterns in visual features of uh, these alleged occupants of these flying saucers or UFOs, call them what you will. People report these things. A lot of them obviously think uh, they have seen something real. Maybe they have, maybe they haven't. The fact remains that it is largely a nocturnal phenomenon and people who often report them are people who are out working at night. Doctors on call, nurses, police, soldiers, all people like this. A lot of them very highly responsible people. A lot of them people of high intellectual standard. Now all this leads you to ideas. You begin to get ideas about this subject. And uh, ideas are what are they doing? What, are, what, is it, what is going on? We haven't a clue what is going on, but what we do know is that the people are very honest, usually, who describe these things. Very seldom do we come across deliberate hoaxes. I mean, there's no point in it because they begin to look ridiculous the moment they start speaking about these things. And we suspect that uh, they, they, the, the UFOs, which bring them, are controlled. Whether or not these creatures that are seen are the controllers of the, the UFOs, or whether they are merely projections from them, is another matter. The way they behave, the way they sort of float over the surface of a muddy field, and all this seems to suggest that they may be projections which are from the object into the minds of the beholders. This is one possibility. Then what is going on? We don't know. Are they some sort of attempt to control human beings? Do they select simple people for this purpose? Select them and work on them. The idea of control is not something new in, in, the, human, um, in the, the world of the human beings. I mean, ancient religions have all uh, sought to suggest that there is control from their deity. Jehovah and the Israelites, Allah, other people, control their people. So the idea of control is nothing new, but this is a modern form of control in a modern uh, frame of reference. Um, is, are these things coming from extraterrestrial sources? There's no real proof that they are. Staffordshire's had a whole crop of flying saucers. Spots in the sky, lights in the sky, strange things. But the strangest of all was seen one day over this cottage. Mr. and Mrs. Rustenberg were living there, quietly, out in the country, and, well, what, you just tell me what you saw. Well, this was one ordinary day. I was waiting for my husband to come home from work, and my two sons went to Cypher to school, and I was getting changed, and I heard this terrific noise. It was just like a giant cauldron of water being poured onto a, a fire, a shh sort of noise, you know. And my first reaction was, oh, the children. I thought maybe a plane was crashing or something like that. And I uh, 
slipped my jumper on and went outside to find my two sons lying flat on the ground in the garden in front of the house, shouting, Mummy, Mummy, there's a flying saucer. Well, naturally, I just said, come on, don't be stupid. Come in the house. But felt sort of a strange sensation. Uh, wended my way up the side of the house to where we had a pump where we used to get all our water from and um, automatically looked up to see this all I can describe, this huge Mexican hat. It was stationary, this thing, and it was bright silver in colour, and it had a dome, a dome. It was tilted to sort of, I could see the occupants in it. You saw people in it? I saw people in it. There were two people in there. Um, these people were beautiful people. That's the only way I can des describe them. Um, they had long golden hair, like a page, bo page boy bob, just like the old kings. You used to see photographs of the old kings. And the, the colour of the hair was golden. Now, I was really... What I, were they dressed in? They, they had a sort of a pole neck jumper affair, like a ski t top suit, mm. in, in pale blue. Now. These people weren't sat behind, one behind the other, they were sat together, but this, whatever it was, was tilted so that I could see them and they could see me. Were you looking at them through windows, through portholes? Um, no, not portholes, it was just sort of the, like a cockpit, I suppose, that had this perspective or glass or whatever it was, they could see me anyway and I could see them. And um, they were, uh, they had beautiful faces. I shall never forget their faces as long as I live. Their foreheads seemed to be a, a bit larger than, you know, the, the bottom of their faces as, as normal people you would expect to see. But um, maybe this was, was just the, whatever they had around their heads, which was like a transparent fishbowl. And they just looped. And I was absolutely paralytic with fear. I couldn't move, although my mind was ticking over. And they looked so sympathetic that I was just mesmerized for what seemed to be, oh, ages, but it could have only been seconds. And I turned to sort of look down at the boys, was unaware that they were with me because I was so absorbed. And the next thing I looked up and it was gone. How low had it been? It had been the, the height, I couldn't tell you. But the house that you've seen, it was just on top of the roof. It was hovering on top of the, the roof. How big was it compared with the size compared, of the house? It, it, it swallowed the, the whole circumference of, of the roof. I couldn't see. The roof was completely blotted out. The chimneys I couldn't see. All I could see was this massive uh, object that I described as a, a, like a Mexican's hat, a Mexican hat without the bubbles. And then it flew away sideways or upwards? No, or? I, I didn't see. I just looked up and it had gone. But I assume it went straight up. Because for a short while after in the sky, I looked around and I said to my two boys, well, can you see anything? Can you see anything? And they said, there it is, mum. And they pointed up and I watched it. It was just like a little cotton meal in the sky. And it circled us three times. It went round three times and then it just shut off and that was it when I started to analyze my myself afterwards uh, I feared that I might have had a, an hallucination but then I knew I, I hadn't had because my sons were so sure about what they'd seen and what I'd seen and I went it went through my mind that it was a secret uh, weapon from Russia and then I thought well it can't be that because if they had something like that they wouldn't need to fear anybody or anything were you but, scared by it? Did you run indoors? Oh, I was petrified. I couldn't move. I couldn't move a muscle. I was paralyzed with fear. But um, now I wouldn't be. Because now, when I look back, you know, I think, what, what, what an amazing thing to have happened, and for me to have seen it. And when your husband came home, where were you? Well, when my husband came home from the office, I was locked in the house with my children under a big kitchen table that we were using. Under the table? Under the table, yes. It's funny now when I look back, you know, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but 
this is the truth, this happened. And that's it. We were ridiculed, it was very embarrassing at the time, and people, they, they possibly thought, oh, she's a nutter, but you know, who cares? It, this is something that's happened to me, and I'm a practically minded person, and that's it. Gordon Crichton is one of the most important people in this field who studied this thing for years. He's an ex-diplomat. He's a man who speaks 10 or 11 languages. Now, Mr. Crichton, I've been studying this thing now for some weeks, and I, I find it a complete, completely bewildering mystery. There are reports of lights in the sky. There are reports of figures appearing on streets. People are seeing uh, little shapes in uh, craft. Is this something solid? Is this something real? Is it worldwide? What, what's going on? Unquestionably, something very extraordinary is going on. Unquestionably, it's a very bewildering mystery. And uh, we're glad to see that um, more and more very intelligent people are bringing their minds to bear on, on these questions. Uh, it's quite clear to me that since the end of the last war, and in particular since the first release of nuclear energy here, which I'm sure is connected with it, uh, there have been a tremendous number of very extraordinary things happening. And this is happening all over the world. Uh, we are getting reports from every corner of the globe of people who are seeing things like this. Uh, that's a, a United States Air Force sketch of the type of creature which terrorized a household of people in Kentucky one night. Uh, they shot at them with shotguns and uh, they said that when the, shot, the, the pellets hit them, it sounded as if they were firing into a bucket. This is a little figure about three feet high. A little creature about three feet high with large ears. Which presumably comes from where? Ah, <sighs> that's the question. What do you think? I've no idea. And I'm sure nobody has. Uh, here you have uh, a case of something seen in, a, in the Renault factory in Cordoba in northern Argentina in 1972. A large thing which was uh, human-like again it was seen in the man's washroom and many other parts of the uh, of the factory encountered by a whole lot of people uh, it caused electrical phenomena it caused the internal combustion engine to stop when people came near it and the runabouts it was seen to go up these creatures were actually seen to leave the factory at night by people outside the factory these creatures were seen to go up into to be drawn up into mysterious craft now, in the early years, and I say that, uh, when I say the early years, for me that means nearly 30 years ago, because I saw one of these things in China in 1931, 41, I'm sorry, in 1941, when I was in the embassy there. I naturally didn't say there goes a flying saucer, because the term hadn't been coined then. Mm. But I did think I'd seen something very extraordinary. And I never forgot what I'd seen. And some years later, I was in America, and I began to see the reports in the press, heavily censored reports, some of them, Sensor. and things, yes, because of military reports, of things that were seen over the Western Front. Uh, and my files began then, and this house is bulging now with files. Uh, we have a lot of evidence of people being maltreated. We have a lot of evidence of cases of people who have been, uh, who have been killed, who have been burnt badly by radiation, by ray unknown forms of rays. People have been carried off and have certainly not come back again. Uh, none of this looks to me like the behavior of benevolent beings. Mm. And therefore, it's not surprising that uh, you've mentioned the attitude of governments. It's not surprising the governments aren't saying anything about it. And I don't want to go on record as being critical of the governments for their view. I think it's a very serious matter. Uh, I think it is not one that one can bring to the attention of everybody. In other words, you're telling me there's a deliberate plan to keep this away from people. Oh, I'm people. sure. I'm sure, and I think very wisely. Because if many people knew what I know about it, from my study of it over now over many years, they, they might be very alarmed. We have many cases on record of cattle being taken. I'm glad to think that some of them like beef. There might be other forms of protein that they might be after, which would be rather more alarming. Um, we have many cases on record where they've been seen taking uh, rocks, stones, vegetation, vegetation plants, exactly the things that we would do and have done on the moon already, and would do on any other planet we landed on when exploring. These do look like extraterrestrial explorers.
and we with also, intent, with people yes. intentionally uh, fishing around, nosing yes. around, yes. With, with a purpose. We also have many alarming cases, alarming because we don't know the implications of them, of blood being taken from people and also semen and also over from women. Uh, there is at least one good case of uh, sexual intercourse, and I would think several, which would stand up to scrutiny. One was a farmer in the hinterland of Minas Gerais state, uh, several hundred kilometers inland from Rio, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he was working the equipment on his farm. They had one tractor, and his family used this in rotation. They kept this capital equipment working throughout the day, 24 hours. One would be working, the other one sleeping. His turn was at night, and he was ploughing his field with his lights on at night. Now, he'd seen one of these objects uh, come down on the 14th of October, 1957. And he was puzzled by this thing, and he went to see what it was, and every time he went after it, this thing went off to a different part of the field, and then it disappeared. The next night, October the 15th, he went out alone and was ploughing when this thing came down again, and this time it came right close up to his tractor. He decided to jump out of the cab and run for it, but he was, says that he was overtaken while he was running by four smaller figures than he, and he's not a big man, who dragged him struggling into the craft, up, uh, up a gangway into the craft. Now this is his story, remember. He says that he was stripped while he was in there and given a medical. And they took samples of blood from him and washed him over with some ungent, and then took him into a separate cabin where a gas was pumped into the cabin and he was violently sick and then after this he was sitting there and began to feel better he'd been terribly alarmed of course and he, he was now feeling better and then strangely a door he said opened and he couldn't see how it could have opened because he didn't know there was a door there and a person came through and it was a female and this one was completely naked according to his testimony and well, eventually he, he, he had feel so, felt so relaxed that the inevitable took place at her urging, apparently. And they then he was... Calls. Apparently, yes, according to his testimony. And then he was shown around, the, given his clothes back again, he was shown around the, the, the craft and uh, was put down again and he went back home. This tremendous story and he locked in his mind. He was puzzled and worried and frightened by it. He began to come out in spots and later, at his own expense, he knew that there had been uh, some stories of this sort of thing floating around in, in Brazilian magazines, in a Cruzeiro magazine like this, and he found his way to uh, the offices of uh, O Cruzeiro and saw one of the editorial staff, Jean Martins, who took him to see Dr. Lavo Fontes, medical doctor, and they took a disposition from this man, a testimony, and gave him a medical examination and he was discovered to have a mild degree of radiation sickness. Now how a man had picked up radiation sickness in the heart of the Brazilian hinterland, uh, ploughing a field, goodness alone knows, living a, a simple agrarian life, very simple agrarian life, goodness alone knows. Now you have to bear in mind that these people who have these experiences are, are not readers of Flying Saucer Review. They're, they're not uh, members of Flying Saucer Spotting Clubs. They're ordinary people. And they're very often, if it's South America, they may be illiterate peasants on the slopes of the Andes. And yet, all over the world, people are having experiences which fall into a recognisable slot. Which means that you and I have to face up to the possibility that this is mental illness which is happening, in fact. These, uh, these are the emanations of people who are ill. Um, it would be a very nice theory. And uh, if it were that, then I think the medical profession have wasted a lot of time in not getting onto it. But we have a lot of doctors who are interested in the subject. And I don't know any of them who believe that it is mental illness. Uh, we do admit that there are cases of people who are very seriously disturbed after having the experience, but not before. One November evening last year, Mrs. Bowles and a friend of the family, Mr. Pratt, were driving out of Winchester when they saw a light in the sky, a light seen by many other people that night. This is where we see the large orange light. That's right, yes, we did. Yes, on their left. On the left here. Yes. And then, then it disappeared, and I am coming up to it now. It appeared again here. But right. it started harboring down below the back of these trees in the hedges here. 
But we came on down the road for another quarter of a mile, maybe a bit more. We turned sharp left to come into Chilcom Lane. It's a bad bend, isn't it? Going down this lane, and uh, we, see we, we were doing about 20 mile an hour, maybe 20, 25 mile an hour. Done about 70 yards down, all of a sudden this car suddenly went crazy. It just leapt off the road to the right, and the engine started to rev. We hit the grass verge, which is a very wide grass verge, about 15 yards wide, and we were heading towards a high edge. So I grabbed the steering wheel as Mrs. Bowles was fighting with it, and suddenly the car straightened itself. We came down the grass verge for about 10 to 15 yards, and we came to a stop. And it was though we hit an invisible barrier, which did it gave, because it didn't throw me forward into the seat, but it gave, and then brought us back to our normal stopping position. That was when we see... Well, then the... Sorry, yes. That was when we see what I shall say, a cigar-shaped object hovering in front of us. Inside were three figures. Yes, they had a, like a cockpit in the, the, the cabin, was in the, the front of the cigar-shaped thing, uh, and was uh, lit up, but um, not glowingly lit up. It was a very easy light to look at. It was hovering. It had either steam or vapour coming out like, like gas jets. Then I see one of these figures get out of this thing, this yeah. object, and yeah. it started walking across towards me. Yes, it was. Now, as it was walking across towards me, I heard a whistle. Which and I didn't so hear. so it's like a, a whistling kettle starting to whistle. Now, he had on like a boiler suit, but it was with a polar neck collar. He had a seam down on his right-hand side. As he walked across, he came to my window. He put his arm on the roof of my car and looked in. Now, he was a tall man, roughly six foot one, six foot two. He had pink eyes, which were very piercing. He had sideboards and a beard, which met. He looked in at me, then he looked at Ted. After looking at Ted, he looked at my dashboard. And as he was looking at the dashboard, my car engine started up. Now, the car ignition keys was turned off. And as the engine started up of my car, my lights were, my headlights were four times powerful than what they normally are. Which? Which was, it was just like a glow of white. I see a movement of this figure. Oh, by the way, I grabbed Ted. And I said, no, Ted, don't get out, don't get out, because he wanted to get out. And I just literally wrapped my body around Ted. And then I opened one eye, because I'd had my eyes shut. And I opened one eye and I said, look out, Ted, he's going round the back to you. I see a movement, thinking he was going round the right, all the way round my car. Ted looked over his left hand and shoulder to have a look around to see if he was coming round. And my words were, don't open the door, Ted, don't open the door. But while Ted was looking round, and me huddled to him with my eyes closed, the figure disappeared with the object. After starting, after it gone, after a few seconds, which seemed hours to us, I started, Ted said, well, let's go. Oh, he asked me if he could drive, and I said, not likely. It only meant because it meant me getting out of my car. I put it in first and started off, but we could not move. It was as though as we were still hitting an invisible barrier. Well, I put her back in neutral and waited for a few seconds, and then I started off again. And we went off perfectly normal in the car. On the Monday, when I got up, I had a rash on my face, down my neck, and on, along onto my shoulder. Which side? On the right-hand side. It was all, like, blotchy. It could have been a ner nerve rash, or it could have been where that gentleman was stood by my window. Incidentally, since this happening, I have had a telephone call from a person from London telling me on no account am I to say anything to anyone about this, what we've seen, because I should be having a government official come round to see me. And after all, this is England, and this is a free country, and I will speak and say what I want, which is the truth. Certainly, about 15 years ago, uh, I, like most people, thought 
that this must be from outer space. But uh, I've long ago ceased to think that it is necessarily the only possible exception, uh, explanation. I think that there can probably, uh, very likely, be other realities. Where? Here. Around us, now? Yes. On a different, different time scale, you mean? Time, space, framework, anything. Other dimensions, if you like. We don't have the vocabulary for it, so it really isn't worth talking about it. Surrounding us now in this room? Yes. I might be sticking my finger through many worlds when I do this. Eastern religions have always said that this is so. So that um, I do not think that we see the whole of reality. I think we have a very limited view of reality. And this is the big problem for man, really, in exploring this thing and following up to know where they come from. Now, I wanted to show you some of these uh, early terms which interest me. Now, let's take a, 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 an early language like Sanskrit. Mm. Now, you find in the classical writings of India, in Sanskrit, in the Mahabharata and the, and the Ramayana, you'll find references to a machine or a vehicle described as a Vimana. Mm. There it is in Sanskrit, Vimana. Mm. And you see what it's called? It's called a celestial chariot of the gods or an aerial car. But now you take modern modern Hindi language, which is the descendant of Sanskrit. This isn't actually uh, English Hindi, so I haven't got any English, this is Russian Hindi. And I look up Samolyot in Russian, which is the word for an aeroplane. And what do I find? Vimana. Mm. So there it is. Mm. Now here I have the New English Bible. Mm. And again, there are very interesting words which occur in Hebrew. Um, there is, first of all, Ezekiel's famous experience, because Ezekiel saw something, and he was afterwards taken aloft. It's described as Galgal, a wheel, mm. and, of course, you have... One objection to this that I've read is that Ezekiel saw a vision and not a thing. Well, I can only tell you that uh, a man in America, I forget his name at the moment, but he is a space scientist, has just written a very convincing book about it. And he fully, it's out in paperback in this country. And uh, is it Blumrich? I think his name is Blumrich. He fully accepts the thesis that this is an attempt by a member of a non-technological society to describe what we would call some kind of machine. A Yugoslav artist has illustrated this theme of celestial chariots, interpreting biblical events in a new light. These pictures, in this case Jacob's Ladder, were used in a book by a member of the House of Lords who spent many years studying and writing about possible explanations of UFO phenomena, the Earl of Clancarty. Then, of course, you see this one here is of Moses uh, coming down in a UFO on Mount Sinai. Mm. And incidentally, in the Bible, uh, the Lord, as they were preferred to, that, the particular God in that space craft, he warned uh, Moses to keep the people away. Now this uh, th this is interesting because there have been many many uh, cases of uh, UFOs in modern times coming down uh, and, and some people have got burnt from radiation and from getting too near to the craft and this was obviously a, a particularly powerful one that came down on Mount Sinai. And then there's Elisha, the ascension of Elijah Yes. Um, Bible is absolutely jam-packed with UFO instance, if you, if, if you read it in that light. And the transfiguration yes. of Christ. Yes. Also in the Bible you've got uh, descriptions of cloud UFOs, taken up in the clouds. Then there's the three Marys at the tomb. Yes. Because two figures were seen. Are oh, you mean the figures in white? Yes. I, uh, I think they must have been uh, uh, euphonauts, space people, those figures in white, because they more or less indicated that, uh, that Jesus had gone, had gone, had risen, and gone, gone up, and he'd come back in the same way, it said. And the ascension itself? The ascension of Christ, um, the picture there, it, it, it shows him ascending in a spacecraft. Yes, that, that's how he went. 
that is how he went back in the same way as he came probably and when you come to think of it uh, there was nothing really very uh, sacrilege about that well, it, uh, just showing that uh, those kind of things are possible you see another idea as to where some of the UFOs, not necessarily all of them, but a considerable number of them may emanate. And that is from inside the earth. From inside the earth? Inside the earth. Now, in my book, this book here, Secret of the Ages, I give some evidence for the concept of a hollow earth. I quoted Nansen's, the famous uh, explorer, Norwegian explorer, who um, made an attempt to reach what was called the North Pole in, eight, I think it was 1895. And at first, of course, it started getting cold the further north he went. And then he found, to his surprise, it began to get warmer. He also, the further north he went, and he was very surprised to find traces of warm-blooded animals in the Arctic Circle at that time. And then, eventually, he reached a warm sea. Uh, it had quite a depth to it. Um, and then, and by this time, they'd lost their way, you see. They couldn't understand why it was, in fact, they seemed to be going down. If you see what I'm getting at. Well, look, just take a look at these pictures um, showing the whole, um, you'll see here, uh, the North Pole, satellite pictures. Um, this is a satellite picture taken in, in 68. Yeah. This would be, what, three or four hundred miles wide, at least, wouldn't it? Something like that, yes. And, of course, it, and then you'd, uh, you'd go in like that, and it would decrease, you see, and go down. And the one at the south, in the south, is not so big, I don't think. Thousands of pictures have been taken by satellites, and only one or two have ever been, I've ever actually taken, managed to take the hole itself, due to the weather conditions, because over the pole, or that area, there was always fog, nearly always fog, over where that hole is. So, it is my thesis that inside the Earth, there is a very advanced technology of, of people there, their descendants still there with the the old technology that they had um, and and the, these um, spacecraft are coming in and out of this hole well not only there but uh, in, in the south as well look and Carty, critics would say that this picture is a composite picture taken from space which doesn't include the section which is black and appears to be a hole. Yes. Well, of course, uh, people are always bound to say anything about uh, anything that's produced. As I told you earlier, most of the time there's fog over where that hole is. Uh, I'm not at all sure well, whether they're all benevolent down there or not. Um, there have been some very uh, strange things which have happened uh, to ufologists, stories of mysterious men in black, you see, who come and um, shut you up, <clears throat> silence you if you get on too hot a track, you see. It hasn't happened yet to me. But um, nevertheless, uh, there have been many, many stories and many strange people have uh, things have, many strange things have happened to people. I think, in fact, that we're going to find out, if we are given time to find it out, 
that, first of all, that we are not the first humanity that has been on this planet anyway. There have been quite a number of others that have come unstuck or been wiped out. Secondly, that man is not just the product of uh, chance, of the ordinary workings out of uh, blind evolution. He's that plus something else. That, in other words, we are the result of some very superior engineering by somebody, somewhere. And I think that opposed to those forces, the creative powers of the cosmos, there are others who you could describe as the opposition or the people who are throwing spanners in the works. I suspect that there is a very great struggle going on for control of us. Now, there is a group in America, from whom I've heard in recent years, who claim that they have evidence that there are four different lots who are struggling for control of Homo Sap. Me, you. Yeah. And um, they would have quite different viewpoints and might not all be what we would call benevolent. Uh, this would explain a great deal because almost without exception these beings of different sizes and shapes are never seen in, in association with each other. Nor are they reported in the papers. No. Uh, you mean as, as in association? Well, you don't pick up your morning paper and read about these things that happening daily. Uh, oh, of course weekend. you don't. But the, now, the, why? The, well, the reason for that is that there, there are subtle methods of seeing that that doesn't happen. I'm not suggesting that there's a D-notice. I don't think they do it by anything as unsubtle as a D-notice. But uh, there are other ways. Uh, I'm sure that phone calls are put through and an item which was not considered helpful is removed. I've, I've noticed this myself many times. Professor Jung postulated the notion that this was a, some sort of kickback from fear, that when people were um, under the impression that they were in great danger from mm. being blown up by atomic yeah. bombs or whatever, that they tend, for some reason which I don't understand, to see things out in the sky. That in fact, man has always looked up to the heavens for rescue, hasn't he? Indeed he has, yes. And if they do see things under these circumstances, then this is equally something which is worthy of examination, I would say. Medical examination or scientific examination. And anyway, Professor Jung, I believe, because we know his uh, niece, Frau Zins uh, Zinstag, uh, has told, she told us that Professor Jung was quite convinced towards the end of his life that this was a very real phenomenon. A real phenomenon in terms of human experience, yes, yes. but not necessarily objectively true no, in well, terms of I've, physical things out yeah, there. Well, I've, I've not gone along very much on the nuts and bolts theory, as I call it anyway, but there is something well, happening in the minds of people which is caused by, almost certainly, by these objects. That's how I see it. So you've got a circle that mm. there's something out there which is causing the mm. brain, the human brain, this is to a react possibility. in a certain yes, way. Yes, this is a di distinct possibility. Because if these were otherwise extraterrestrial pilots surveying the Earth, then they've been an awful long time doing it and not getting anywhere or making contact with us, direct contact, only just in odd individual cases with odd people. There's certainly not uh, a, a planned uh, invasion or anything like this. It doesn't appear like this at all. Looks okay. like a child fishing in a pond. That's indeed. What are we looking for? Something solid or something tenuous? That's a question I ask myself.